Well, thank you, John. Uh, it's an honor to be here. I appreciate you inviting me. It's an honor to be here with the other distinguished speakers and the panelists. And we're going to talk about an interesting topic. Thank you, Stuart. Appreciate it. Now, while we run through these slides, uh, you may be wondering why we're even talking about the Holocaust. What relevance is that to what's going on today? I'll just point out to you that 100 years ago, the best doctors in the world were in Germany. The best bioscientists, the best public health administrators, the best nurses, the best of everything. And I cite as evidence the fact that someone you know well, Michael DeBakey, went to train in Germany during the Third Reich. And he went there specifically because American medicine was not up to the standards he aspired to, and the German doctors were simply the best in the world. I was fortunate to interview him before he died and asked him why he went to Germany, and that's pretty much exactly what he told me. And if you're interested, you can see the info yourself, uh, which is online at the website of the Center for Medicine after the Holocaust. The second reason we study this is that we are influenced greatly by what happened in Germany during the first 30 years of the last century, and American medicine has been greatly influenced by developments in Germany prior to World War II. Now, I want to speak about the Nazi analogy because many of you may be thinking, well, I'm not a Nazi. What does this have to do with me? And I think that's a very legitimate question, and we're not comparing anyone with the Nazis, nor are we comparing America to the Third Reich. Rather, I think of it in terms of Mark Twain saying the following. History may not necessarily repeat itself, but it often rhymes. And that's what we're talking about. That the people in Germany 100 years ago had similar problems to those with which we deal today. And they came up with solutions that were initially not so terrible, but ultimately became extremely dysfunctional. Now, I'll tell you also about a case when I was an intern, when we admitted a woman who was 100 years old, and she'd been in a nursing home for 12 years, was being fed by nasogastric tube, and she developed gangrene of her leg. And she was suffering mightily. We were not going to operate on this woman. She was very seriously demented. And this at a time when 100-year-old people were very, very unusual. We don't, we nowadays, they're not so unusual. Back then, it was very unusual. And she was moaning mightily and creating a great deal of moral distress, as it were, and we decided that we would end her life by administering potassium chloride to her. Now, we would have gone ahead and done this, except that we had a chief resident who's from Texas. His name is Dick Cashin. Some of you might know him. This was in 1971. We all had long hair. This was in the Northeast. And Dick was from Texas. He had short hair. He, he is what would now be described as an evangelical. And he called us all into the chief resident's office and said, you will not do this. This is not what doctors do. So we did not do that. But it was a very formative experience in my life, and I've thought about it ever since. And I thought about why he said we do not do this. And there's two basic reasons we don't do this. And those are the pillars of Western society in general and Western medicine specifically. The first is Mount Sinai, when God gave Jewish people, the law. And in that law was great reverence for life. Life took great precedence over most everything else, not everything else, but most everything else. The second pillar of Western society and Western medicine is Hippocrates. Hippocrates lived at a time when suicide, uh, euthanasia, infanticide were all reasonably common. He was, a really, he was really a rebel. He came up with his principles that were not well accepted at the time. However, they've survived for 2,500 years, and you've heard Hippocrates mentioned several times here today. We are most familiar with the oath attributed to Hippocrates, and I'll just talk about two specific aspects of his essentially eight-point oath. The first is reference to a higher power. We don't think of the Greeks as particularly religious other than their mythical gods, 
But yet, if you read the oath, it does appear as if Hippocrates is appealing to a higher power. The second thing, which is relevant to what we're discussing today, is his statement about euthanasia. And he says, and I will not give a drug that is deadly to anyone, if asked, nor will I suggest the way to such counsel. And likewise, I will not give a woman a destructive pestery. And in a pure and holy way, I will guard my life in techne. Now, this is a rather remarkable statement at the time. Anthropologist Margaret Mead noted the uniqueness of this statement, saying that it's the first time in our tradition there was a complete separation between killing and curing. The shaman now was responsible only for curing, no longer for killing. Fast forward a few millennia, and we have the formation of the United States of America. With these magnificent words, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among them are the life, liberty, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I view the founding of America as the best amalgam of the two mountains on which Western civilization rests, Mount Sinai and Mount Olympus. In fact, many people are aware of this, but for those who are not, the Judeo-Christian heritage is very strong in the United States, particularly at the founding. We are the only essentially Judeo-Christian country in the world. What I have on this slide is the first seal of America proposed by Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and Thomas Jefferson, which shows the Israelites crossing the Red Sea. Because the Americans at that time thought of themselves as the new Israel. They were very fond of the Hebrew Bible or Old Testament, and it was a very important founding document used by our founders to come up with what they thought was appropriate for America. Fast forward another hundred years, we have three very important people for our discussion for today. Charles Darwin, who came up with this theory of natural selection and put a real dent in religious belief because his theory was quite powerful. We also have his cousin, Francis Galton, who came up with the notion of eugenics, which I'll say more about in a moment, and Otto von Bismarck, who was the founder of the modern welfare state. This is a definition of eugenics by the Oxford English Dictionary, which is the science dealing with factors that influence the hereditary qualities of a race and with ways of improving these qualities, especially by modifying the fertility of different categories of people. And you have positive and negative eugenics. And of interest is at the time when Galton and others proposed this theory and put forward the theory in great extent, Jews were not considered among the inferior races. They were considered one of the superior races. After World War I, which was devastating particularly to Germany, with many maimed soldiers wandering around Germany and great difficulty in caring for these maimed soldiers, a very important book was written by a physician, Alfred Hoche, and a lawyer, Carl Binding. And this book was called the release of the destruction of the life devoid of value. And in this book, which was very popular at the time and drew worldwide attention, Ho said two things among many interesting things. The doctor goes to work in his office without knowing exactly what he must do and what he must not do. Not even the Hippocratic Oath is really binding anymore. He's detaching the his profession, the medical profession, from the Hippocratic Oath. He goes on to say, and I think he's referencing all of the distress and misery he saw around him in patients, and also he's reflecting the fact that his only son was killed in World War I. It is impossible to doubt that there are living people to whom death would be a release, and whose death would simultaneously free society and the state from carrying a burden which serves no conceivable purpose except that of providing an example of the greatest unselfishness. And because there actually are human lives in whose preservation no rational being could ever again take any interest, the legal order is now confronted by the fateful question, is it our duty actively to advocate for this life's asocial continuance, particularly by the fullest application of criminal law, 
or to permit its destruction under specific conditions. One could also state the question legislatively like this, does the energetic preservation of such life deserve preference or as an example of the general unassailability of life, or does permitting its termination, which frees everyone involved, seem the lesser evil? His view, and that of many others at the time, in Germany and elsewhere, that the best of humanity could give their lives and sacrifice during the war, why could not the least of humanity be sacrificed to benefit society? So the German society underwent some fundamental transformations that allowed them to pursue what Hoch and Binding were actually talking about. First, the doctor-patient relationship was replaced by the state Volkskörper or nation's body relationship. Now this is a critical transformation because it allowed the German medical professionals to believe they were still occupying the moral high ground. Instead of the Hippocratic doctor-patient relationship, you now had the Hippocratic state-nation relationship. So they felt they were operating well within the Hippocratic oath. Secondly, eugenics became the governing principle of Germany. In fact, the Third Reich's governmental philosophy was called applied biology. So following on that, when Hitler became chancellor, Hitler became literally the doctor to the German people. Interestingly enough, doctors and nurses and others in Germany who had been imbued with eugenics for 30 years before Hitler came to power and were also buoyed by the success of eugenics around the world, enthusiastically and voluntarily embraced eugenics as they have for the preceding 30 years. They were not forced to undertake Hitler's program. They were enthusiastic about it. This is one of the myths that prevents us from examining what went on in the Third Reich and allows us to distance ourselves from the best physicians in the world at the time, believing they were forced to do what they did. They did, were not forced. They were enthusiastic about what they did, and they also profited from it financially by all the work that was created, and also academically by receiving promotions many times to chairs of eugenics or to heads of universities. At the time Hitler came to power, roughly half the universities in Germany were headed by physicians. Given this view of life and eugenics, those who were considered genetically inferior were viewed as pathogens under the microscope that had to be destroyed to prevent the German body. Here's a poster that literally shows Hitler as the physician to the German people. This is what the proverbial slippery slope looks like. Just run through some of the numbers here. In 1933, a few months after Hitler came to power, the sterilization law was passed and 400,000 people were sterilized in the next six years. The Nuremberg laws defining Aryans and non-Aryans saying people had to get genetic clearance from a genetic court, which included physicians to marry, were passed. Definition of Jews were passed. And shortly thereafter, in 1938, the child euthanasia program was instituted in which 5,000 children were killed because of genetic disabilities. The adult T4 euthanasia program began the next year with the onset of World War II. Now it's interesting to note that Jews were initially excluded from the euthanasia program because being of the inferior races, which is what Hitler and his Nazi colleagues declared them to be at the end of the 1920s when they took over the eugenic movement, Jews were not considered worthy of mercy killing. So the euthanasia program was not directed against Jews specifically. In the adult T4 and the wild euthanasia program that followed, roughly 200,000 German citizens were killed in six killing centers. These six killing centers were where gas chambers and crematoria were developed as public health measures to rid the German body of the pathogens defined by the Third Reich. You're all familiar with the medical experiments. You heard Dr. Wainerdi talk about them. The medical experiments, as you can now appreciate, were relatively small change, and that's certainly a medical professionals that were willing to kill people who have no qualms about experimenting on them, especially to improve the German body. And then we have the final solution that we're all aware of. Now what you're 
as little known as these facts are, the role of American eugenics is even less well known. As I mentioned, well, reflecting on Courtney's remarks, talk about moral distress, nobody wants to hear about their colleagues behaving very badly, and they certainly don't want to hear about their American colleagues behaving badly, but in fact, Americans did behave very badly and often served as role models for their German colleagues. After Gregor Mendel's work was rediscovered in 1900, eugenics got sort of a scientific patina, an intellectual respectability. Mendel's genetics explained why there were superior and inferior races. At least that was the theory at the time. And this theory was widely accepted. I've listed some people in different areas of life that were enthusiastic eugenicists, the presidents of Harvard and Stanford. Alexander Graham Bell, Nobel laureate Alexis Carell, Presidents Theodore Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson, Supreme Court Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, was an, was an active eugenicist, and importantly, philanthropists like Carnegie, Rockefeller, Kellogg, and Harriman supported eugenics in the United States and also supported eugenics in Germany. Germany did not have a lot of money in the 1920s. Rockefeller, in particular, subsidized eugenic research in Germany. The Kaiser Wilhelm Institute for Anthropology and Brain Research, the institute which Mengele worked for, was built with Rockefeller funds in the late 1920s. Here's a book written by an American, Madison Grant, and a corporal in the German army read this book in the, when, after it was published in 1916 and said this book, which describes Aryan superiority and the need for the development of a master race, was read by Adolf Hitler, who wrote to Madison Grant and said, this book is my Bible. Here are examples of comparisons between what was going on in America and what was going on in Germany. Slave labor was initiated in the late 1930s. In Germany, we had had slavery in America for several hundred years before that. Anti-miscegenation laws preventing people from getting married in Germany were passed in 1935. We had had Jim Crow laws here for 60 years before Hitler came to power. Hitler correctly asserted that his definition of a Jew, which was a person with one Jewish grandparent, was much more lenient than the American Jim Crow definition of a black person, which was a person who had any, even one drop of black blood in them. Sterilization law passed in Germany in 1933, involuntary sterilization. The first involuntary sterilization law in the world was passed in the state of Indiana in 1907. In 1927, in the infamous Buck versus Bell case, the Supreme Court said that law was constitutional. They were actually judging a Virginia sterilization law. But at that time, there were roughly 28 states that had involuntary sterilization laws in the United States. Euthanasia began in 1938 in Germany. We had very many cases here in the United States, most famously in 1915 by Dr. Hazelden in what was interestingly called the German Hospital in Chicago, uh, allowed children to die, newborns to die with multiple <laughs> congenital defects. He became quite famous for this, went on to make a Hollywood movie called The Black Stork in which he starred and was chastised by the uh, Chicago Medical Society or the Illinois Med Medical Society, I've forgotten which, not for having euthanized his child but for uh, making a public event of it, for the publicity that followed upon the event. And of course, you know about medical experiments. We were doing them here in the United States, which created a great deal of difficulty for the prosecution at the Nuremberg doctor's trial. One lesser known point, the immigration laws. Hitler wrote glowingly about our immigration laws in the United States in his book Mein Kampf. And in particular, we had a Johnson Immigration Act in 1924, which prevented immigration to the United States from Southeast Asia, Chinese and Indian specifically, and almost eliminated all immigration from Eastern Europe and Russia, which prevented people 
emigrating to the United States as Hitler closed his grip on Europe. Here's a doc of the Nuremberg trial at which 23 physicians, bioscientists, and administrators were put on trial. And this was a big event because we had the first time a definition of war crimes involving medical criminals. However, you get the impression there were 23, doc 23 bad physicians, bad medical personnel. The fact is there were thousands of them involved in the sterilization, euthanasia programs, ascertaining genetic uh, fitness for marrying, and so on. But only 23 were put on trial. Importantly, this trial focused almost exclusively on medical experimentation. That's why you're well aware of the Nuremberg Code that came out of this trial. But you hear very little about euthanasia or other sterilization or anything else that was going on in Germany at the time, which is one of the unfortunate aspects of this trial. However, you would expect after this trial for the Hippocratic Oath to be reasserted, saying, well, clear what the Nazis did was wrong because you cannot euthanize people. And they also did many, many forced abortions. Really, we don't know how many were actually done, but there were too many to count. We do not have an accurate count on forced abortions. However, shortly after this trial, the World Medical Association was founded and issued its Declaration of Geneva in 1948. And it's interesting to note how they transformed the Hippocratic Oath at that time. Now, you see what it says here. The first part of the Hippocratic Oath I mentioned to you before is now transformed I solemnly pledge myself to consecrate my life to the service of humanity without any reference to a higher being. Since that time, the Hippocratic Oath has been modified many times by the World Medical Association, and many other Hippocratic Oaths have been devised. At Baylor at the University of Texas here in Houston, the students take the oath that bears the name of Hippocrates, and now that oath reads as follows. I do solemnly swear by whatever I hold most sacred. So a medical student is now swearing to uphold the medical creed, whatever that might be, but whatever he or she holds most sacred. Regarding the part of the Hippocratic Oath that used to say you will not do an abortion and not uh, offer euthanasia, even if the patient asked, it's been transformed. So now it says that I will exercise my profession solely for the cure of my patients and will give no drug, perform no operation for a criminal purpose, even if solicited, far less suggested. The onus of deciding what medical professional ethics has been transferred from the medical profession, which is what Hippocrates was all about. The medical profession established its own code of ethics to an external force, in this case, the law. I won't do this as long as it's criminal. However, I might do it if it's not criminal. It's a fairly radical change which came about in the face of the horrific events of the Holocaust, and it's rather surprising. Germany has had influence on us as well. Bismarck, as I mentioned, was the founder of national health insurance and the welfare state Flexner, Abraham Flexner, 1910, at a time in which there were 155 medical schools in Canada and the United States was asked by the Carnegie Foundation to reassess medical education in the United States and Canada and come up with a solution. He was specifically sent to Europe, Germany in particular, and he came back with what's known as the Flexner Report, which essentially Germanized <coughs> medical education in the United States and Canada. The number of medical schools in the United States shrunk dramatically. They were no longer run as apprentices Apprenticeship, apprenticeship schools, but rather as scientific schools almost always associated with universities. And that's the medical education system we live with today. World War II had a profound influence in medicine. Uh, Germany, which was the leader and won all the Nobel Prizes prior to World War II, was replaced by the United States. The Nuremberg Code influences our medical experimentation and scientific research and informed consent to this very day. Operation Paperclip, scientists whom the United States wished to obtain and keep out of Russian hands were brought here from, brought here from Germany and particularly were not prosecuted for their war crimes. Think of Werner von Braun, used to when we have a problem, a rocket scientist. 
four of those 23 people in the dock at the doctor's trial were at one point or another after the war in the employ of the United States military. Hubertus Strughold, who's the father of aviation medicine in the United States, was also the father of aviation medicine in the Third Reich. The fault lines of Western medicine were revealed by our response to the Holocaust and specifically to the doctor's trial. Now, a lot's happened since then. That was 60 years ago. And we now have a situation in the United States where we're dealing with our own rationing potential, high cost of medicine, and how are we going to deal with this? I won't go into everything here, but I'll just show you a few slides that give you an idea of what I'm talking about. During, during the third, during, excuse me, to begin with today, we have four basic principles of bioethics, autonomy, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. The Nazis also had four basic principles, if you want to view it that way. Theirs were eugenics, non-maleficence, beneficence, and justice. The Hippocratic and the religious oaths tend to have four principles as well, but the primary principle is life, neither eugenics nor autonomy, and that changes the way you think about how you practice medicine. So if you look at what's happened here in the United States in terms of euthanasia, in the last 40 years since Roe versus Wade and the simultaneous passage of laws in Netherlands allowing for euthanasia, a lot has happened. Most importantly, we have the laws in the state of Oregon. The state of Oregon attempted to deal with the financial problem by limiting the amount of money they would spend on procedures and literally drew a line above and below certain procedures saying, below this line we will no longer pay for this procedure. And that did indeed save money. They went on to couple with, couple with that a Death with Dignity Act, which meant that if you asked for it and went through the appropriate procedures, you can actually have physician-assisted suicide. Now, you have very awkward situations in, in July of 2008 with at least two patients, one of whom is filmed in this movie called How to Die in Oregon, were denied their medical treatment. And in the same letter, were offered physician-assisted suicide. Needless to say, they were very, very upset about this. They did not think this was appropriate. And the movie is very interesting, How to Die in Oregon, because you see their reaction. And again, there's moral distress, to say the least, in these particular patients. Now, President Barack Obama, uh, I'm, I'm thinking about Dr. Brody's talk about our misunderstanding of end-of-life issues. He was talking about his own grandmother who had cancer and needed hip replacement. And just go to the end of this, this, this particular statement. He said, to give my grandmother everybody else's aging grandparents or parents a hip replacement when they're terminally ill, the chronically ill and those toward the end of their lives are accounting for potentially 80% of the total health care bill out there. This is a statement by President Obama, which is patently incorrect, even if you hadn't heard Dr. Brody's talk. When I heard this, I was reminded of this particular poster, which was widespread in Germany, showing the ones who were genetically superior bearing the load for those who were genetically inferior. And what this poster says, you are sharing the load. A genetically ill individual costs approximately 50,000 Reich marks by the age of 60. And if you substitute chronically ill for that, you see the potential for disaster in the United States. The only states in the union that really have euthanasia laws right now are Oregon, Washington, Montana is on the way, and it was just recently rejected in Massachusetts. But it seems inevitable that the Supreme Court will be asked to deal with this issue, just as it was asked to deal with the abortion issue 40 years ago, and it's not clear what will happen and how that will go. So when you have that particular attitude that the quality of life is more important than life itself, that there's insufficient funds to provide medical care for everyone, and that we may need to ration medical care, and you permit euthanasia, there's potential for disaster here, potential for rhyming, as it were, and it's not clear how that's going to turn out. As Dr. Wernerdy said, the next 10 years are going to be very interesting, 
None of us know how it's going to turn out. I offer this to you as a cautionary tale of what happened in this previous society, which was the best in the world at the time. Thank you.